one piece of information that I'm willing to reveal. So I'm not very happy about it, I'll, I'll do it. I think within the team, we would have given him some 2,000 different ideas. Since I wanted the audience to feel what this character is feeling, we are literally putting the audience in her shoes. So we wrote three additional scenes, which are not part of the script. We shot it again for two days. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Ask VR, where we're going to be talking about Game Over with the producer Shashikant and the director Ashwin Sarvanan. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. For having uh, come here to explain, or as the popular term these days is decode <laughs> the, the movie. So, but before that happens, before the decoding happens, I just want to tell you guys one thing that I firmly believe is that a film uh, speaks to us, right? It's supposed to communicate to us. So, while I find it always fascinating to know what the director intended and what they wanted to do and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's okay if you don't feel that same way because uh, it just means that you had a slightly different reaction to it. So I just don't want you guys to beat yourself up because you know, oh, I didn't get it and therefore I don't know film or something like that. That's perfectly okay because there are lots of films that I haven't gotten, there are lots of films that everybody hasn't gotten. So there is no one way to see a film. I just want to say that we are here mainly to see what went into the making of this film, what ideas went in there, what creative inputs went in there. And so not to kind of say, that's, this is right and that is wrong and this is not about that at all. So with that disclaimer out of the way, again, welcome to the show guys. So one of the things that, that, that many people have asked us is why, like for instance, uh, Monisha Uday has asked, was it intentional to leave certain things without explaining uh, in detail so many things? Because many people have gotten on to points about who are the serial killers? Why aren't you showing their faces? How do they choose these two victims? Why do they target these two women? Uh, what exactly happened to Tapsi in the past? Because you kind of show fragments of it, but you don't explain what happened. So the decision to kind of not fully reveal these things, can you talk about that? I've always seen this film as a very subjective narrative where you uh, get inside the character's head and, and you experience all the events of the film, of the story through her eyes. And there's been a lot of films like, you know, Memento or uh, American Psycho or, uh, you know, a lot of films that, that take this route where you have an unreliable narrator who's giving you a lot of information but you don't know for real if it's happening or not. And especially since I wanted the audience to feel what this character is feeling, we are literally putting the audience in her shoes. For example, there is a, there is a scene in the first half, and it's a VR session, where we're literally looking through her eyes and experiencing what it takes. And the overall sound mix of the film and, and the way it is treated, the shots and all that, it, it really constantly tries to uh, you know, take a very subjective stand on what is happening to her. So the, all the details and all the backstory and all the little things that, that, that changed her, it's actually you are knowing those details through her and not through an objective point of view where you are cutting to a flashback and we are knowing and what happened to her exactly. Especially in the scene where she's sitting in the storeroom and she's going through her head what really happened to right. her. You just get the sound cues and what all she heard and that, that the camera stays with her and it, it's, it's very dark and it's very obscure and all that. So we really wanted the audience to feel for her, for what she's experiencing and what she is going through rather than what happened to her in terms of information. The exposition is more of a more of her perspective and her demons or her nightmares rather than a piece of information. So that was one of the basic decisions we took because we wanted the film to feel like an experience rather than a, a objective story that goes from point one to point two and it's not an even base, it's not right. a plot driven right. film. It is a plot driven film but it is uh, predominantly uh, told through the character's point of view so that it doesn't feel like that. So that, that was our aim from the beginning to make sure that this, fil this film feels very personal uh, and this film uh, feels like a like it's our triumph like it, it feels like our uh, you know us fighting it out rather than the character because that's the association you have in video games right, right. because you see a character on, on screen you follow it you are controlling it and you feel as if you are the one who's dying so the whole idea for the, uh, the second half being like a video game I really wanted them to experience it from the beginning so that it doesn't feel like such a big departure when they get into the actual home invasion. So tell me one thing, the, you talked about subjective, right? But the film opens objectively because it's nobody's narrative, yeah. it's a third person narrative. If yeah. anything, it's the stalker's na uh, yeah. a POV because that's the, uh, yeah. the point of view shot that we get. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you justify that in terms of, because that's the only part that stands out from the, yeah. once we see her jogging, it becomes her narrative. But before yeah. that, 
How do you justify that? A lot of uh, reporters who saw the film asked me the same question that, you know, you open the film with a scene like that and it created a lot of curiosity about, you know, who these people are and you have an answer that later, you haven't paid off later. But uh, the way I see it is the opening scene was more like a prologue that sets up the film's mood and what the film can go, what lens that the film can go to and the kind of violence that you will, you will see in the film. So it was more of a, a, a setting up the mood and tone of the film rather than giving certain information. And that was the reason why even the prologue was a subjective take. Even the prologue was not objectively shot. Right. It was still the point of view of the killer. Yeah. So you are always, you know, you are either voyeuristically absorbing the victims or you are absorbing the, this character. So we really wanted the film to feel completely subjective. So, but the first five minutes is from the point of view of the killer and then it shift to, shifts to her and then we continue to follow her until they come back and attack her. Shashi, when you read the screenplay, uh, did you have any, uh, okay, let's explain this, but like, do you have any arguments like that saying, will this get across? Um, no, I think the same conversation where do we justify the actions of the killers was, I think that was what actually drew me to this because we were looking at it from victim's point of view and the fact that you don't, the victim doesn't know why those people are coming and attacking, right? So we needed that, that perspective and I think there was a huge debate, a lot of people who would come into our discussions and give inputs, they were always doing the same thing. And we were on the same page, we said from day one, we said this is going to be that film, where we don't need to, that's why the, so you don't even have the thing of removing the mask and showing real people, it's, right. it's not even that, yeah, it, yeah. it didn't even go to that point to say this is the thing. So there were so many metaphors also that we were, and why I chose the film, I like subtext in like the films that we make, we, there's, a, there's a larger concept and that came through in the very first uh, like three pager that he had sent us. And we knew we were onto something even at that point of time and yeah, I think that's what we got yeah, to actually. Yeah, yeah. If Amuda is, is saving Sapna or diverting Sapna from negative thoughts, why didn't she save her when she jumped and got injured? Okay. We see her like preventing the erasure of the tattoo because yeah. she's like, you need that as a reminder to kind yeah. of, uh, yeah. you know that Amuda is telling her yeah. that I yeah. will not let you remove this tattoo. Yeah. Why doesn't she? Actually, the tattoo pains her, the first time the tattoo pains her was when she, when the maid mentions newer. Right. The second time it pains her is when she crashes into the mirror and she goes to the restroom. Right. And those are not exactly two instances where you say she's in trouble and she's trying to warn her. Right. So for me, uh, the main idea is when you get a tattoo, the tattoo really pains, the area around the tattoo pains the, the same day. And the fact that she was assaulted the same day, same night, it makes it very difficult because what she's experiencing is an anniversary reaction and the tattoo pain can be an extension of the pain that she actually felt right. the previous year. So we really wanted to tap into that as well and uh, it was very it was very convenient for us to to take the supernatural angle as well. So you don't really know if it, if it pain because of because every time she thinks about killing herself, she's probably reminded of the trauma that she went through earlier and that is the, maybe the reason why. But it's very interesting. See. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's this series called Vida the Karpa uh, that came out in the 90s, which was about a, about a guardian angel in a village who kills people who, who, who commit crimes. So uh, a doctor called Reena comes into the village and she starts researching about it and she says, there's no way this can be a god, it has to be a, a mortal human. And she finds out that there's a guy who does it and even after they unravel the entire mystery, she says that he is suffering from slip personality and the entire village believes that he is God and the God, God has gotten into him and, and the God has done everything. And there are enough proof in the, in the series that supports both theories and in, in the end they don't resolve it, they just keep it open. And it completely changed my life because I thought it was genius. Because anyone who doesn't believe in God still has a, has, gets something from the, from the TV series and anybody who, who like, you know, who's very uh, religious and who's very, uh, who believes in this stuff, takes back something saying that the God has come through, it's like Kalki Avadar, you know, right, people, right. you know, God taking the form of humans to take yeah. revenge on people who do bad things. So that completely changed my life and I think I've carried forward that, that kind of sensibilities ever since. And I feel like it, I get a kick out of doing things like that where we have multiple perspectives to the same narrative and still every single thing holds true and it doesn't dismiss the, dismiss the other theory just because this is true. Right. I, think that's, that's, I think that's a very healthy way to look at a narrative and, and enjoy it even after years so that you'll still have conversations around it, you still have arguments about it. But the best part is you get to choose your uh, own uh, conclusion about you know what the film is about. I think that's the question that Radhayan asks. Uh, my question is for Ashwin Sarana. Bharadwaj Rangan in his review 
stated that the film script can be viewed in various angles. Was this planned at the very start or is it something that you and Kavya planned towards the end of the scripting? And I think from what you just said, you like that sort of thing, that, like that where you cannot lock down yeah. uh, one particular... Uh, and also I feel when we are developing, like looking back now, I really feel the script kind of wrote itself after a point. I feel like, you know, it just the, it like, it's like meeting the right people at the right time and, and listening to the right ideas. And, and working with the right people kind of shapes the script, right? I think the script started sh uh, taking shape by itself after a point. And it kind of, right now it looks like it's accommodating every single theory that is coming up because it really has the space to support all those theories. So I'm really surprised by how much it has expanded right from the writing stage till now. I'm surprised by how much it has expanded into something more, something bigger than all of us. When you ask typically people who want to try out new things, young directors like you who want to try out new things, the typical thing that they say is that uh, they're a little scared because uh, they they want that kind a big kind of box office success and they want the probable ABC centers to accept their film, so they end up kind of doing a lot of things that they don't want to do but they think is necessary to be done. You don't feel that at all. No, when you have a producer like him, you don't have to like you know like you really are looking at it. See, you cannot be completely self-centered and and say. Uh, you know, I'm going to make an indulgent film which I which will satisfy only me, and I'm going to forget about the audience, uh, which you are doing to, to a certain extent. But you also, it's very important to have a very. Uh, it's like a. It's like the filmmaker is the mother and the producer is the father, and he knows exactly. You know when to. You know the child is the film. Right. He knows exactly when to say the no. This should be done. This should be done. The mo the mother is spoiling the child, and the father is probably teaching it manners and discipline and all that. Right. That's a See, great. I, uh, yeah, I, so I feel like, you know, only when you are like, I see, I look at him as like a, like an editor who takes a manuscript and, and beats it into something that's more, uh, you know, that, that actually makes it reach its full potential. Great. So you, you tend, tend to tend to overwrite or underwrite or, or, or there, there are clarity issues with the script and all that. So when you, when you have a, a person who's, who's not judging it or who's just looking at it from an objective editorial kind of point of view and then he can push you to write what is best and write get, get the best version of the script right i think that's very important i think you need to have some kind of a creative mind behind you who can actually uh, you know shepherd you into the right directions and uh, to see the actual potential of the film i think that is the key you know to see what this film can be rather than seeing for what it actually is so that potential is what i think uh, you know they managed to identify with the film and that has helped me realize it as well, actually. Actually, it's a great way to describe a typical producer in the Hollywood sense. But out here, we don't have that concept of a creative producer. That's still relative. You know, either people produce their own films, like Mani Ratham and Madras Talkies, or you know, Gautam did some things. But, but the thing is, anybody who's... The pretty typical definition of a producer is, this guy is going to give you lots of money to make your film. So when did this idea of becoming a creative producer get into you? Like in the, in, in the sense that he's saying of shaping the film, realizing its full potential. That kind of was the starting point for everything because, you know, before this I was an architect. So I have a very, you know, different discipline of, we're all looking at problem solving and design. There's a, there, I look at production as a design. It's, it's, it's how you would be able to bring many elements together and put it together, right? So for me, Production was a qualitative process rather than a quantitative process. It was not how much money we are putting for how much money we are getting back. But it's, it's uh, so for me, I, I wanted a point of departure because I knew the practice was to hear subjects and, you know, say okay to a film and things like that. So the first thing that I taught myself is to how to read a script. I went for screenwriting classes. Oh. You understood what is a three-act structure or whatever it is, right? Give the basics of this. So that kind of uh, then, so as a producer, you were kind of training yourself to look for that in things. So, so the raw material is easy to identify if you know what you're looking for. Like if you're only saying, okay, come and narrate the story, then you don't know what you're looking for. Here I can see, okay, listen, there's, there's a problem in the first 20 minutes because you're not, you don't, there's no resolution for the, what we've set it up. So there's this conversation that he finds it very easy. All, all my our directors who are there, find it easy because I come from a perspective of looking what is there, what's the vision of the film. And I think, see, through this whole process, I don't think we'll ever claim that idea, this idea, that I don't think that's no, no, a no. problem at I, all. Yeah. But it's the vision. I think both of us found that you know where the film is going right. to go. And I think we just pushed it because these things, is it a game? 
Is it a psychological thing that's happening in like your dream? head? Is yeah. it a dream? But this, that was the wonderful part of the writing because it gave you the texture to go after everything. The, the swing that was just moving in the background. You, you had so much of embellishments that were happening because it lets the mind go wherever you want to. This film gave us that opportunity and then you should go for it, right? Not a lot of films will give you that cerebral thing to just keep going for it. And we also wanted to maintain it at the front of it. Let it be a thriller, whatever, you know, what, whatever superficially people would want to absorb it. Let it be that. We'll tick mark all those things and then we'll figure out what is there below that. Edge. So this is not again about whose idea, like you just said, this is your idea, this is Ashwin's idea. It's not that. But just for the sake of explaining to the, to the viewers what a creative input is, can you think of something or remember something that you saw in the script and said, okay, maybe this is not working. Can we look at another way to do it? Or maybe Ashwin, can you answer that question? Uh, we actually shot the film for 35 days in both the languages. We cut it together, we saw the rough cut and we realized the first half was setting up a lot of things very fast. So he, usually the producer tells you to cut it down, right? He asked me to extend it. He asked me to write a couple of additional scenes so that we can pace the first half better so that the audiences will have enough time to process what, what just the, all the concepts that we keep throwing at them. He really wanted me to, uh, you know, slow it down so that the audience will have time to process. Right. So we wrote three additional scenes, which are not part of the script. We shot it again for two days and we... Like, can you name one of those scenes? The scene where uh, she comes, uh, she's sitting at the table and uh, she had cr crashed into the mirror the previous day and Kalama comes and helps her out and then she looks at the TV and she sees this news, right? That was written, that was written in film after that. The news that the serial killers yeah. are... Yeah, because okay. it was even more abstract. Yeah. The fact that there are the only clue that you have in the original cut was that the point of view of the camera, nothing else. You have absolutely no information about who they are or what what they have done before. That that was even worse, like you know, that you we literally gave nothing. But after that we felt like, you know, let this be a credible source of information, this TV be a credible source of information, where we know that there is a there is something looming at large and at some point the, these two things are going to kind of, you know, meet each other. So we, we wrote that scene and also there is a scene where uh, uh, she comes back home and uh, she tells uh, Kalama about what she's going through. Uh, right. About you know that scene, it, one of the most important scenes in the film. It was actually written and shot after the fuff cut, because we always assume that you know that was implied and people will get it. But hearing it through her completely changed the whole film. Right. Because it really set the film up emotionally, and we started really understand what was going through her head. We started understanding. Uh, that the trauma doesn't end with the the perpetrator going to jail or getting his punishment. It doesn't. It, it it always lingers, and you need to fight your way out of it. You need to process it. You need to reconcile with it in on your own and not with anybody's help. The legal system is not going to do that for you. So that part of it was actually highlighted through that one single scene, which was written after the edit. And these are all discussions that you had. Yes. yes. After watching the rough cut, we had a discussion. And he kept throwing us ideas about this is the uh, pay, uh, you know place where we need to slow things down and have something else and you need to explain this better and all that. Just so something like he was always open to uh, he because he actually told me an interesting thing thing about Amir Khan where he finishes the film and he leaves the set without destroying it and then he he puts the film together and then he goes back and shoots stuff and tests has a lot of uh, you know test screenings and. Uh, so that he'll understand what the film is making them feel. It's like an emotional mission, right, right. which kind of keeps turning and you know twisting, so that you know at some point it's gonna work, it's gonna click. And those three scenes that we shot completely changed the entire film. Fantastic. This is a luxury that I will not get in another usual production setup, where they'll be more uh, uh, insistent on finishing the film and releasing it, instead of just looking at the film in a very objective point of view and realizing what it actually needs and what are the loopholes or whatever that the right. emotional uh, gaps that we need to fill. Amazing. Just adding to that, I think uh, on hindsight, we were also ready for it in, in, the, in the sense that this is, a, this is a film that was not pat down on script. You know, it's, it's it, because it had so many explanations to do, right? There was the memorial tattoo, there was the anniversary reaction, the, you know, there were many concepts that needed to be explained. And I think the pacing of the, the, the scenes is something that was very difficult to judge at the script level. We, we knew that, you know, what is the, even if you look at it, there's actually the film starts off with uh, Tapsi jogging. Yeah. So that's a scene that actually used, come, comes much later. Okay. We said, let's just, the mood, it, it opened up with her sleeping and Kalama So there's a shot in. where uh, the camera pulls, pulls back from the TV 
and she's sleeping on the couch and Kalama comes in and opens the curtains and she puts it on her head, right? Yeah. That was the opening shot of the okay. film. That was a shot where we introduced Swapna. And we thought it was too dark. Again, and it's same mode. After having a strong opening scene, coming back to another kind of thing, didn't feel like getting into her world like right. thing. So we said, let's just open it big, show the you know the ECR, yeah. OMR thing. No, yeah, the jogging. daylight helps, you know the just, definitely. Yeah. 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 So just let it go. Let's sing because this is a new place that we need to get in, and. So that's the reason I think we were ready even like when we were in the scripting stage our production was ready saying that listen I think we'll give it that space. So we did a lot of test screenings, Pushka Gayatri, a lot of people came and gave inputs and that's the thing that they we consistently found that there were too many things that were thrown and I think it was difficult to digest the by the time you had one thing there was something else coming. Right. So we said that, you know, let's just pace it and uh, I think it really worked out after the, the, you know, all the new scenes were put in. So Ashwin, is there the danger when you do test screenings that and take this kind of reaction? I mean, I know a lot of people pass around a script for, for feedback, but I'm talking about like this kind of testing that you veer away from your original intent. Is that danger there when you, when you show to too many people before, like, you know, after you've shot it? I'll, I'll answer this. Uh, not because of that, because see, you know, I have this thing that some of the directors, when you give inputs, right, they get scared that, oh my God, the idea is coming from somebody else. It's not. For me, it's exactly the opposite, right? It all becomes theirs. It's about who, you know, what are the suggestions you're picking up? I think within the team, we would have given him some 2,000 different ideas. <laughs> but it's the director who realizes that what's the, the correct thing that needs to get in. So I don't think there was one thing that he didn't concur with that got into the film. Like, it was not like half-hearted, okay, these guys are saying it, let's put it in. So that we found it right from the first time we sat, second. See, we'll, we'll have to calibrate whether that the, if the director starts doing everything that we do, then we are in a, there's a big problem for us. But if the director can go back, think, come back with a new script saying, no, no, that doesn't work, but this works, well, keep this. We were confident about what we were throwing at him. That is also something that we built right. over a period of time. I mean, you have this trust and uh, it also depends on who's watching the film. Right. And uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, I'll observe them during the screening. I'll try to talk to them. And usually, they can't fix the film. They can't give you solutions. But you can understand where it's not working for them mm -hmm. or you can understand the rough edges of the film. So that you can actually figure out the solution yourself. It's more like you're looking for an emotional reaction. And if it's not there, then what do you do to actually get it? So you are you are actually strengthening the screws when you are screening it for others. Yeah. You are actually fixing the polishing the rough edges and stuff like that. But uh, in terms of if if someone had said the film doesn't completely work for me, we would have we would have we would have been completely okay with it because we believed in the film. This was more like testing waters where we see the film realizes its potential to the fullest. That's it. Like our conviction uh, for the film stayed the same throughout the process. It did not change at all. So. Lakshmanan Karnappan says, uh, he has a great question actually, did Game Over start from a character that is a victim of sexual abuse overcomes her fears and fights evil or did it start from a plot? What if life is a video game and would you have three lives to reach the goal and the stakes and the dangers increase progressively? That's a very interesting question yeah. but I'll, I'll tell you something. Uh, we always go through this daily in our lives. We, we go in a car and somebody kind of cuts us off and uh, scratches our car and he keeps driving and we're stuck in the traffic and we replay this incident over and over and in our head we probably go chase after him, stop him and beat <laughs> him to a pulp or we you know, uh, you know, get the help of a cop and go to his house and beat him. So we all have this visual film and fantasy that always, that's always there, right? But we never go through with it. We even have imaginary conversations with people that we hate and you know, coming back with smart, smart you, know, you know, like replies and all that. But we never do it in real life. I was just thinking from a point of view, what if a gamer has this kind of a visual film and fantasy where she reconciles with her own trauma. So that was a starting point because even if she's uh, on a wheelchair, what her mind isn't is in like, uh, you know, constrained. What, so what essentially should be a fight uh, back against her own, uh, you know, inner demons became the narrative of the film where all this, this masked man became the metaphor, but I'm not saying it's real or not. What I'm trying to say is uh, she is actually fighting herself in the whole audience. She's not fighting them, she's fighting herself because right. actually her psyche is crippled. Her, her conference is broken right. and she thinks that she's physically and mentally completely vulnerable. So to, in order to come out of that and people usually feel better in the virtual world when they play a game and they, they have this uh, sense of, they get some kind of 
uh, this this superhero fantasy right, that you right. have in real life, right? I can't do this, but I can do this in virtual world. I can beat people up. I can do all these things. All the, it, it always plays out like a wish fulfillment fantasy. For me, what appealed is the fact that this girl uh, uh, choosing to uh, do this exactly at the same time where she was assaulted, exactly the same hour, the final counting down to the new year. So that was very interesting to me. And right. it was always about her fighting back her own fears than some external force or, you know, something something that, that comes to kill her. Right. So the, the killers basically, as I saw it, was like they may be the serial killers that the TV says, but they actually what it is, is her inner fears and inner demons is how I saw it. But one thing that I want to explore uh, when you said gamer is like, why not something like Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, something like, you know, and literally battling the inner demons as opposed to Pac-Man which is such an 80s game, you know, it's like the most primitive. And I mean, what I'm saying is uh, the game is, it's a very simple game about trying. Right? So, so just how did you decide on that? There's some one piece of information that I'm willing to, uh, you know, uh, like reveal. So I'm not very happy about it, I'll, I'll do it. But if you take Pac-Man, there are actually four things chasing at you, the original Pac-Man. But in this film, you'll see three. You have digitally removed one of them. So in order to signify what, what is actually happening in her life. So that was very important to me because there is this relentless quality to Pac-Man that we don't see in other games. And it's constantly, you, you cannot rest somewhere. You need to constantly keep running, running, running. And the Pac-Man has a very, very fascinating structure that once you take this particular capsule, you will start chasing them. So there is always this, at some point you will turn back and you will start chasing and they will start running away. So there is always this very, uh, you know, very satisfying gameplay that it has and it kind of lays it out in a very uh, clear-cut fashion that you see all the wrong choices that the character makes. It's a very objective point of view of the maze rather than your subjective point of view where you experience all the dead ends with the character. You can see what like are the characters It's not a VR-like doing. thing. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I really feel the entire film structure can be, we, we kept, like in a couple of test screenings, this idea wasn't come across and we were panicking saying that these people are not getting the Pac-Man, you know, analogy and all that. But I, we, we kind of stuck with it, and it, it actually paid off. A lot of people are uh, arguing that the film is an allegory for for Pac-Man, and you know, there's a lot of similarities between the gameplay and the actual film's narrator. Krishna Kishore Verma says, "Do you think it's all a dream, uh, or is that is it that she's just imagining about a new game that she's going to create?" When she talks to the doctor, she says she has been sleeping good and also getting good ideas about new games to make. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to kind of prelude. Uh, when we, I was reading this uh, script for the first time, I felt very interested in this whole idea that somebody can go and edit their dreams, right? Because this is one of the things that I used to do as an architect because you were always designing the house in your dream. You, go, you can build this thing, bring it down, take it out and put it back. And so this whole notion that you can actually, I used to edit my dreams, right? You can, you'll go fall, no, 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 I want to come back again. You have this thing. And so when I was reading this, this was almost like that. It's like, it's so funny that if you were in a tough situation, right? If you knew that something's going to happen to you, and then you, were, you had the choice of going and going into your dreams and actually editing those things, you will always find the better way to do it, right? This almost felt like that, that you are editing your way of going to do this, right. and you'll find the best way to come out of it, right? I felt really connected with it, actually. <laughs> I think everybody, every creative person goes through iterations of his own work that he, you know, first of all, he'll write a crappy rough, rough thing and then he'll improve it further, but it's still not good enough. And the third time, he'll actually make it a best, right? So I think every creative person goes through that iterations of his own work. I think it's, it's, it, it still holds up, you know, the theory that, you know, the, she can actually build this whole thing up as a, as a way of you know, finally reconciling with her, with her trauma. To take this guy's question further, by that point, Amuda's mother has come and told her all the things that happened yeah. to her. So, did she design a game using all that and using those theories? I mean, why not? See, probably, uh, as a gamer, she would have looked at this incident and she would have wondered what Amuda could have done to, uh, what Amuda could have done differently to get out of the situation. Right. She could have definitely thought about it. She could have seen, she could have used this as a weapon, she could have used that as a weapon. She would have definitely thought about it. Right. Anybody who, who you know, feels sad for someone else will definitely uh, want them to have done something, something else right. to, to, you know, get out of the situation. So I think it, as an artist, you constantly dramatize the ideas that you get and the events that you hear, right? You constantly dramatize it. So why not? You know, I felt very sorry for Amuda. Because, I mean, she got the shit under the stick, like she got cancer three times and 
the psycho thing at the beginning. So did you feel that there was too much happening to that character at, at any point? Because it's like a the cancer angle and then at the, that utterly gruesome, uh, you know, killing at the beginning. Because one of the reporters had the same feeling that, you know, she shouldn't have died this kind of like this, especially after going through this cancer for three right. times. And uh, my, the graphic designer, uh, Gopi Prasanna for this film, he, when I was talking to him, he said, uh, I know a guy who survived cancer for three times and he got into an accident and died. Right. So that's, that's pretty much life for you. And I also feel that Amuda is the seed that was planted in Swapna's head that actually makes, empowers her in a very uh, right. strong way. So I think that uh, the, the, the point that she stood for, the, the truth that Amuda stood for, actually got realized through Swapna. I feel with all, I didn't fight alone, uh, you know, the, the poster that she had in the right, room right. and the way she was supporting a lot of other people. I think she actually ensured that she kept, she lived on through Swapna. Kandi Sachin says, don't you think when a good chunk of the first half is dedicated emotions of both Tapsi and the other girl, it is important to give emotional closure to the character. I'm going to take this. I think there is emotional closure to the character because at the end, I think you have this thing of things having reached uh, full circle and it's the end and there's fireworks outside and the world <laughs> is celebrating and Vinay K. Siriginidi says my friend has his own understanding about the three lives Swapna gets. He thinks the first two chances were a dream which was shown by the ghost to her so that she realizes that she had to fight for her only chance which makes it more realistic. Did you have that intent? I'll tell you something very interesting when I pitched the idea to him and we're discussing something at some point at one point he just stopped and said he just I can't, I can't spoil it but he just said what, how, you know, is this how you see it? I said, yeah, no, I don't see it the same way. And he gave me his theory of how this is playing out and it was perfectly valid. And I had my theory of how it was playing out, it was perfectly valid as well. He said, let's not, let's not, you know, explain this and ruin it for others. My theory holds true, your theory holds true. Let's just keep both of it in the film and let it work on its own. Right. And I was really surprised because I thought he saw the this second half in a certain way and suddenly he had a completely different take which was equally good and which was equally true and relevant. And I just realized that this film had that space to accommodate people's perspectives and it's really the way you see it. So I think that that's, very, that's a very valid question where you can consider the first two attempts as premonitions uh, given to Amuda to Swapna about right. what to be prepared for and then Swapna actually taking the initiative in the third. Desandri has a very logistical question. Where do the killers get the address? <laughs> <laughs> See, there is something, uh, if you go to a tattoo parlor, it usually has a wall of fame kind of a thing right. where people, uh, you know, they take photographs of people who actually got tattoos there and they'll display it as the work or they'll have a catalog of photographs where it has uh, the, the photograph of the people involved and all that. I think, I think the, the photograph the killer has, I feel in my head, comes from that. So I think you, you'll probably find your answer there. <laughs> What about you, Shashi? Well, I think again another question during the whole thing was that, you know, at least the profiling of these killers is something that, you know, you should give. So I think in the title sequence, you will get a glimpse of what are these guys trying to do, what is the profile of the women that they're going after. So there's a very specific idea the women getting into bars and tattoo parlors and the modern women are the profiling of these killers is something that we wanted to just keep as an on the edge of the thing. And a lot of people said it's one of the guys working in the tattoo parlor, which I was like, yeah, it, it could be that. I mean the guy has gone to this extent, knows the geography, everything of the place and stuff like that. So I am sure this guy might have done some research, got some friends inside the tattoo parlor or something like that. Naveen Anagani has a question about why the handicap? What is he gaining by shooting uh, this person by killing him? I think a lot of serial killers uh, enjoy the idea of trophies. Yeah. So they take back something from the, uh, the murders that they can uh, go back and have it as a treasure. So. I think the trophy that this particular killer is carrying is the fact that he was able to put the put these women through this and he was the one doing it and he probably rewatches it later at home and enjoys that and and he gets a kick out of that what he was able to uh, do to these people so I think I'll definitely consider that as a trophy that these people See have the the angle that has never been spoken either by him or the entire team is the whole idea about the, the women angle like the the social commentary that's been very clearly put into the film but never stated in any of these things is this the, the voyeurism that goes behind you know uh, yeah. women and things like that or if you just look at the entire film from that, it's it's a cancerous situation. 
you know who are these three you know un unidentifiable fears that happen right, within right. women so the analogy when you look at it only from a female that yeah. metaphors right will all fall in Completely, place actually yeah, yeah. so what is this guy look, doing this that it's that it's just the extent of the visual voyeurism that actually is there with women and you know things like right. that it's so everything was a specific trait that needed to be thrown in but never said in any of the things actually right because the way i thought <laughs> even the the three the one guy becoming three, one killer becoming three is like to take a metaphor further is that the cancer is metastasized, you know, so it's, it's just, you know, multiplied and kind Absolutely. of, it's, it's kind and, of a thing. So it went with his idea of the gaming because every level, the, 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 the problem becomes more complicated. It evolves those, they give you different problems to solve and things like that. So all of this actually fitted in, in yeah. many layers that we didn't have to think too much at all kind of fell in place actually. But the women angle, if somebody actually looks at it from purely from that perspective, a lot of the smaller details would could kind of, you know, this is not home invasion, it's invading your, you know, your, private your space. Space, yeah, yeah, yeah. Space. space. So these are all mental space versus your own house, which is your own. Everything will draw parallels with what a woman goes through in, right. in, in right. space. Right. Actually, yeah. And also there's one interesting point that comment that one of the people may, I don't remember the name, he said, uh, the fact that the masked man is carrying a camera itself is traumatic to Sapna because she was subjected to this videography and photography when she was, you know, assaulted and it got leaked and all that. Right. So invariably, I think she's very afraid of being captured on camera and being exposed uh, and and shown to the show. her most vulnerable uh, state is exposed to the entire world. I think uh, inherently she has that fear of you know cameras and being exposed to camera. Tardar says there's a connection between Sapna and Amudha run more than bone deep does. Amuda beating cancer thrice imply three lives earned, which are then inadvertently transferred to Swapna. Uh, yeah, I can definitely say that because the image of Amuda spotting three tattoos and Swapna having three tattoos is very similar if you, if you think about it. And the shape and size of uh, both of the tattoos is very, very similar. So you can actually make a valid case by saying that, you know, it is a, it is a representation of three lives that she was literally, she died and she was reborn, reborn three times. Through, through cancer. So that's how people see it. It's, it's that difficult. So you can actually say that she had three lives as a person before she finally passed away. And now she's like passing on to, uh, you know, Swapna and giving her three chances uh, in life. And three chances to kill three people, that also. <laughs> 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 Tell me one thing, when both Amuda and Swapna are single or single woman with a uh, caretaker kind of thing, they live in these enormous houses. Why do horror films or thrillers <laughs> love this? Why do we do this one BHK? Uh, thriller, you know, so. <laughs> That's pure logistics, pain of staging a scene with cameras and 50 people around you and you know you just want to kill yourself, it's Even a small in space. Even a large space it was claustrophobic, I mean it's just like really claustrophobic kind of thing, it, you know. And I also think, I mean that I think was built in saying that, I mean she is well off and she doesn't want to stay in yeah, pl yeah. places which are very crowded so she had to stay outside the city. And outside the city, you don't have these little places, so I don't know. I, it, for us, it didn't make too much. No, no, it doesn't. But I'm just. No, like, I think it's pure logistics. It's necessary actually shooting in that kind of space before because it really gives the artist to perform and you to technically because in a film like this, in a technical film like this, you really have to have the kind of precise execution. And sometimes the the, the restraint, the, the space restrictions will really uh, even for lighting the film will be a huge pain. I think one of the most effective points of the movie was when she's making a getaway in the police car and uh, she just looks back and like, you know, that's, that's seriously something no one expects because I expected the killer to be there. I mean, sure, because we've all seen horror movies that are like, but the twist is that yeah, he yeah, multiplies, yeah. you know, that's I think the, the, the thing. So Anirudh says, I loved how the film had unbalanced runtime. The first half was long and the second one was short because I don't think I could have sat through even an extra minute of the Groundhog Day gimmick. Two halves are completely different but pieced well together. Which half you like better and why? And did the mystery behind the killers being unrevealed feel un uh, incomplete for you? I'm going to take this. Uh, no, the mystery didn't, didn't feel incomplete for me because I didn't feel these killers were necessarily real people. It's more like Ashwin said about fighting your inner demons. And uh, I think the unbalanced runtime didn't bother me at all because I felt this film was kind of it built and built and built and built and first it kind of laid all the pieces together and then it just like accelerated full throttle you know so that that I think really worked for me because as opposed to having let's balance out with two scares in the first half as well 
you know, instead of that, you're kind of laying a psychological uh, profile for the whole thing and then kind of diving at the end of the first half, you give that voyeuristic shot by the window, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, that's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of dive right in into the, the second half. You know, that, yeah, that's... And look at the film structure like a water ride in uh, MGM where you slowly make the, uh, you know, ascending and then you drop, you know, head fast into the water. Yeah. So, it's the, the space of it will be very terrifying because you, you know that it's going to drop. So, you are just slowly, you know, holding on to your seat, even if it's very slow, yeah. you're holding on to your seat and you're, you're feeling a little, un, you know, uh, like it, 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 it gets to you, kind right. of, you know, you know what you're in for. So, that's the reason why we had to do the prologue in the beginning because somewhere uh, the audience will know that this, go, this guy is going to come back and attack the, the protagonist of the film. So, in order to uh, be afraid of him, it, it was very important for us to set, set the film up and set, set how much violent this can get and how much cruel this can get, we really needed to uh, make the make a very strong impression so that it will keep the audiences engaged till the intermission of the film. Right. They will keep waiting for the, the big bang to happen somehow. Yeah. And the, the sense of discomfort should be there. I mean, see the thing is a lot of people think, is there a lag in the first half or whatever thing. It's not just the lag, it's a certain sense of discomfort that started creeping into you. The little hidden things, you, yeah. you, you're waiting for the inevitable fall, free fall that's going to happen. Right. And then when everything you feel, because by the time the emotional core of the film unravels, you think the film is over. But then suddenly when the camera starts peeping into your thing, when you're like, oh my God, this is what we've been waiting for. So I think it was a calibrated idea to get there at that kind of pace. Otherwise, I think you would have, you would not find the second half as interesting as you know. It no, the second half. That's what I said. It just goes yeah. rams into you. This yeah. Guy. But I think what's what's there is also even in the first half, you still have those borderline creepy scene like that scene where she goes into that storeroom or closet kind of yeah. space where you're kind of. I mean, we think there's going to be like a big jump scare, but then that's also a bit of, yeah. you know, anticipation because we're kind of the, we're used to something happening and then it doesn't happen. So that's also a bit of actually if you cut off the prologue and the, the handicam shot and the intermission, you have a film. You have a film that stands on its own and it's just a happy ending and everybody's Yeah, because you know, after after Amuda's mom comes and tells yeah. her she she's okay. You know, she wants yeah. the tattoo. Yeah. Uh, so know, the film ends there, kind of. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a great thing. I never I never looked into that. Right? That's amazing. And you know, and even the third, everybody said, why didn't she prevent the you know the last suicide attempt? Actually, if you realize, if you see the structure of the thing, she's thinking about something else. She doesn't even give the tattoo the time to save her. She just walks and then then falls off the like car. Like exactly crashes into her the minute she lands yeah. on it and all that. It will look a little forced when you look at it from the point of view. it's like a god's point of view when you look at it. But I felt that it was meant to be. That's the car should have hit her and she is stranded in a wheelchair where she can't do anything. She can't run away and kill herself. Right, but I also looked at it as like like further weakening in a way because yes. it's like, you know, she's 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 already weakened mentally. This is weakening her physically yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. And then finally she fights, you know. Yes. That's how she has to get out of yeah. everything. Yeah. You know, that's kind I of I really wanted her to feel like it's like an all is loss kind of a moment where they're at their worst phase. And then slowly the change comes from right, right. Rupan says, is there any significance? This a lot of people had this question about the same highest score she ends up with while playing Pac-Man every night. 144820. <laughs> so there was like, you know, so what is this? No, actually. Nothing. No, just a There's sample no, number. Yeah. Please decode it for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Kaushik says, what is your question? Take on the question between uh, Kalama and Swapna. I'm going to take this quickly because um, I think that's, that's a really amazing relationship that you guys, uh, that you just wrote because usually the caretaker is another person who either gets killed first or here there was an, a tangible relationship and the scene that touched me the most in the movie emotionally was the fact that Kalama went along to that therapy session you know that was amazing because these are such closed private sessions that Kalama was there spoke volumes about their relationship that you didn't have to spell out at all that yeah. was kind of really amazing. Kartri and KN asks if the number three is tied with PTSD or maybe stages of PTSD or something like that because three life references, three villains, uh, Amuda beating cancer thrice, that doctor treating Swapna through three stages in VR. So come on, you have this mysterious smile. I'm sure you have an experience. <laughs> like an ex See, surprisingly, uh, we actually had four iterations uh, when the film, when we started writing the film, and later it was cut down to three because it really, uh, you know, this one, two, three. There is some rhythm to it, right? Later. So. I think, yeah, I think inevitably, I think everything ended up being that way because you have this number in video games. You have three lives and, and you know, it's a standard thing and you see X, zero, you know that you're screwed and 
if you don't win it you're going to it's going to it's going to be game over right so that number is kind of you know i really wanted that pattern to be throughout the film so that we understand that there is a beginning middle end to everything that is there to the to the film structure so aminathan wasn't has another logistical question he says what is the significance of the swiggy delivery guy in the movie he was there in the start before the first murder and also in the ccd when swapna collided before rushing out was it intentionally done or any decoding which you missed is the killer a swiggy delivery guy <laughs> 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 see the killer is a swiggy delivery guy that's no, why no. somebody asked us whether they they, they sponsored us or something <laughs> <laughs> see i think uh, that's the most common side during nights right you either see people walking their pets or you see people buying food. you know get getting their food delivered from swiggy yeah. we really wanted to uh, set up set it up as a first image so that it tells you that it can happen to you right Th- this can be you getting the delivery from the the guy so that was the first image we wanted the film to have because it was such a because we we shot it once the swiggy wasn't very visible and then we went and reshot it so that we, we were so specific that that swiggy thing should be com- not because of the brand or anything but we really wanted it to be an identifiable image right, right from the start because right. i don't want the people to think this is happening to some guy in the outskirts or you know i don't want them to think that this is this is this only happens in movies so that image was a was, was a very important part of setting up the film's reality so adrian david says kavya ram kumar the co-writer how has she helped shaped tapsi's character arc has she helped give a female perspective to the film absolutely because uh, there is see when you get a writer uh, who's done who's written short stories you're basically hiring someone who will provide a lot of perspective to the character that a filmmaker usually misses out on because it's not literature it's a visual medium so there's only so much you can you can do to highlight the character's thoughts and what they're feeling it, it's through music and sound and the colors and all that but still the the films that are adapted from a book will have that additional depth that the the films that are written doesn't have you understand what i'm saying yeah, like yeah. you know it has this personal edge to it that that's that can be that that will have rough edges but it it'll be very real that you know you connect to those characters better they'll be fleshed out better yeah. and it'll be more personal and and they don't have any rules you know they just go out and express themselves and they're not constrained by three act structures and plot points and stuff like that so i think the the character side of it was a huge uh, plus for me because uh, she had a lot of uh, personal touches to the to the character and the and the, her overall arc that we would have conveniently ignored if we were set on just making a you know a thriller film like like can you name one character uh, for example there is a scene where she uh, she crashes into the mirror she goes to the bathroom and the next next day she is just sitting in the table and working and there's no absolutely no hangover of the scene that happened before for me that was very scary because i thought okay there there has to be something right but we go through so much shit in life and then we wake up and then we still do the same things we do without you know we we kind of accept it after a point of time and we always convince ourselves it's going to be it's going to get better the next day so that was one scene that i wanted it to be a, a little serious and all that but she just shrugs it off by saying paravala kalama like that like it's nothing but it was a huge uh, emotional uh, scene for her uh and crashing to the mirror she feeling helpless and the tattoo painting her and all that but those little touches is what makes the whole thing very right, real right, right. so finally a question for both of you from vinay pandit is there any hope for the part 2 of game over cause i really want to see tapsi in the sequel to this movie <laughs> i'll let him answer it but he has to write it first <laughs> i can't answer this without him writing but we at least internally maintain that there is always going to be another story that needs to be told i mean whenever somebody says game over when you say it's not so till we say so right. i think there's there'll be a story to be told and i think that's the story of women and things like that we we even wanted to come up with something which says that you know game over then we wanted to have a thing saying that not till we say so right so there's there's going to be another story that needs to be told in the revival and things like that i'm hoping that some at some point of time game over part 2 happens actually great thanks thanks guys for stopping <laughs> yeah. by and for the rest of you till the next episode of ask vr keep watching film companion south <laughs>